CBS 4 News, in partnership with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, present... We think we found a triceratops up in Thornton. I heard the clink, clink of what ended up being the shoulder blade bone. We're going to peel this off carefully, and then we might be able to collect this lower jaw. When you have that one, two, three, you're going to hold your breath for a minute. It could have been destroyed. We would have never seen it. The Thornton Triceratops. This is how you're used to seeing dinosaurs, complete skeletons in places like the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. But finding them in nature is a lot messier. I'm Stan Bush. When construction crews ran into a pile of bones in Thornton, neither they nor paleontologists knew what to expect. But they allowed photojournalist Mark Nitro and me to follow them on site for what became a historic find, a discovery that almost didn't happen. All of this is based off of something I picked up the size of a quarter. So how close did we get to going through this thing altogether and having this discovery be lost? A matter of feet. D so, can you explain that? So we were about, I'd say, three feet away from going through the center of the skull. If you're looking for a hero, a police and fire station is always a good place to start, though not usually before that building is finished. But for lovers of science and the natural world, this is where unexpected heroes emerged and overcame incredible odds to accomplish the extraordinary. The city of Thornton began work here to expand first response services to this growing area, a publicly funded project that had been planned for years and underway for weeks. Dan Wagner was only brought into this construction site when another company couldn't do the job. On August 25th, the inspector and soil analyst was checking freshly poured concrete when he saw a bone sticking out of the ground. I started dusting it off with my boot and grabbed a shovel and started scraping more of it away. And it was the sandstone was going away in chunks. And then and then I hit the, the shoulder blade bone. It was heavy and it made a clinking sound. It got the attention of site supervisors with Saunders Construction, who were nervous about stopping work on the site, but did anyway. The last thing you want to do, they shut down a job over a stick in the ground, right? And, and that's essentially what we did. We, we shut it down, we fenced off an area to try and make sure that we weren't going to trample what could have potentially been a stick. Yeah, let's do five and I'll see if I can get five. It led to a call to Dr. Joe Sertich, the curator of dinosaurs at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, who believed almost instantly that what he saw were the bones of a triceratops. I could tell that we were dealing with Cretaceous dinosaurs. And given that there were multiple bones of one individual dinosaur exposed, it was a really promising first, uh, first investigation. So you knew that this, this was going to really produce some good stuff here? I knew it had a good chance. I was a little worried that it was only two bones. Uh, there was a horn exposed and a shoulder blade. And so I thought, well, there's a, a chance that there's more of the skull in the ground, but Sometimes that's all you get. Speed you up, and that way we can get a cap on these. What they were uncovering, though, was still a mystery. By the time a full dig crew was on the scene, a surprising amount of bone had already been found, using the latest technology from Saunders Construction to see what else was under the ground. What is this doing? So this little thing over here is scanning the site. So in a lot of sites, we go through and we map the traditional way. We lay out a grid square, we draw the bones in. This thing actually sends out uh, infrared and it will map the surface and give us uh, several million points over the surface of this that reconstructs the site. But technology could only go so far. The team learned quickly that nearly everywhere they stepped a dinosaur bone was underfoot, leading to an extended search on hands and knees. Many of the people on the dig team have to work by hand to dig a trough around where the fossils are and they don't get to use shovels or even hand spades. A lot of the work is from screwdrivers or big needles like this so they can pull the dirt out. The team was digging back 66 million years to a time when the mountains were still rising and the Denver area was a thick prehistoric forest where dinosaurs like Triceratops ranged and T-Rex hunted by the thousands. Still, not every bone is immediately known. We are now frantically trying to figure out what it, what it is. Some of the frill bones that we had exposed didn't look quite right for Triceratops. But it's always hard to tell. Fossils along the Front Range are plentiful. But discoveries are rare. And this one almost didn't happen at all. This thing could have been gone forever in just a couple of minutes. It was literally minutes away from just being buried again. It really is amazing when you think of all the things that had to be perfect in order for us to find this. You know, the, the depth that they excavated was right above this thing. 
you know, to find one little piece of fragment of a bone and to know that 10 minutes later it would have probably been completely covered. By stopping, the construction crew saved the dinosaur from being lost forever, something paleontologists believe almost never happens. I totally imagine that there are dinosaurs that are being dug up and plowed over all around the Denver area weekly. And there's so many fossils that are just below the surface. And there's so much active construction going on in the Denver metro area that I'm sure dinosaurs are being hit constantly. You called the people who found this heroes. What did you mean by that? When you're working in construction and your boss is saying, let's get this thing done, and you're under time pressure and cost pressure, when you find something like this, it's really easy to just keep grinding away and to just avert your eyes. And I didn't see that. And I don't know how often that happens, but I think it would be a natural human thing to do. Pressure because it's a public project. Heidi Williams is Thornton's mayor. I do have to imagine that some people in city council or who work for the city, when they find out that this police and fire station may be delayed because of this, that that starts to freak people out when sure. they're dealing with taxpayer money. Yeah, because, you know, delays mean, you know, cost. The good news is that the contractor had built in this kind of 10 day window, I think they said. So it wasn't, it ended up not being that big of a deal. Construction, in fact, didn't stop. Buzzing everywhere, but the site, well, paleontologists dug deeper into history. And as new bones became evident, so did new headaches. By the fourth day, paleontologists who had hoped for a bonanza learned to be careful what you wish for. So the museum is trying to get these two big pieces of skull back to the museum tonight, but one of the problems they're running into is that the more they dig, the more bone they find. I don't want to find any more in this spot. This is a nightmare. We're missing all of the limbs, so the forelimbs and the hind legs, and they're probably around here somewhere. Every so often, paleontologists would notice a bone that gave them pause, something that just didn't fit, but they couldn't waste time wondering what it was. Once the fossils are exposed, they become extremely brittle. They're quickly treated with a plastic resin to survive the extraction, so paleontologists could get another look at what confused them an important job run by Natalie Toth. We have a nice barrier of rock between the fossil that's exposed now on the bottom side, so that's good. Using burlap dunked in a plaster mixture, Toth began wrapping fossils like broken arms. Things can crack or break out of it. Things can come out of the bottom or places you don't want, so this really helps to encase and protect the entire contents of um, what's in here. The first few pieces move easily getting a rib, some vertebrae, and even the beak out and to the museum. To get them, dinosaur hunters have to dig underneath the bones and flip the casts over, hoping nothing falls out. The process exposed how big and how complicated the initial discovery actually was. So this is an area where everyone was digging just a couple of days ago, and what they ended up finding was even more bones. So the team is now trying to wrap these in plaster as quickly as they can to get them to the museum. But to just give you an idea of how big this site is, this was the main find, but it goes so deep. As they were digging down, the team ended up finding even more bone. The skeleton wasn't laid out perfectly or hardly at all. More like a plate of spaghetti noodles, twisted and locked together. It's sitting up against more frill here. There's more frill behind it. And then this is full of frill. Ribs and skull bones poked out of every direction. To get the discovery back to the museum, the team would have to find a way around those bones without destroying them. Sertich struggled to find a way through a massive hunk of bones, separated in places by just a few millimeters. The original discovery bone looked like we were able to get it right out of the ground. And now here we are on our third day of digging and it's still sitting here. The horn is touching this bone. There are at least three other bones going in along the edge. And every time I try and dig around them, I hit something else. So you can't really pull this thing apart, can you? Or? Uh, I'm going to. This thing is making me mad. A single cast over all of them would have been too big and too heavy. Sertich decided some fossils had to be snapped on the scene with hopes of reconnecting later. We had to navigate our way around the bones. We had to find channels between them to be able to separate the skeleton safely and get it back. And so there was that moment of frustration a couple days in where it just got to be too much. It left two blocks weighing tons, requiring heavy machinery to move. And putting this historic find 
back into the hands of construction workers. I was worried about breaking it and ruining something special. One wrong move, you'll break it in half. It was a success. You know, it's great when you put all this hard work in for the entire week and then you're able to see, you know, all the fruits of your labor show up in the back of the truck. After getting the bones back to the museum, paleontologists made a bold claim. That's one of those magical moments that only happens every decade or so. Declaring the Thornton Triceratops the most complete Cretaceous dinosaur ever found in Colorado. They were half right. In front of an eager crowd, they began to cut into those gigantic plaster jackets protecting the bones, where a major secret had been waiting millions of years to be uncovered. A secret that could rock the world of paleontology to its core. The excitement from the find spread far beyond that construction site. Coming up, how the Thornton Triceratops could inspire a generation. When a kid sees something like that, it might change their life forever. The first Triceratops ever found was here in Denver 130 years ago. The most famous one lives here at the museum, but you've probably never seen it. This is Dinger, a single rib bone found while Coors Field was being built. Dinosaurs have long captured our imagination, but what happens when you find out that you've been living next to one for years? Overnight, this area changed from a quiet neighborhood to a dinosaur fanatics convention. I didn't believe it at first when my husband told me. And he says, turn on the news. Turned on the news. Guess what? He wasn't lying to me. The construction crews unearthed a dinosaur skeleton. The discovery happened less than a football field from front doors. It was exciting to get the police station, the fire station, but this is once in a lifetime amazing. Homeowners started to rethink if the rock they had been digging through in their own projects may also be a part of history. What do you think? I think it's possibly what everybody thinks it might be. Her discovery ended up being just a piece of fossilized wood. But with more bones coming out of the site, more amateur dinosaur hunters began looking to the ground they were standing on. That looks like muscle shell. and tendon and stuff. See the vertebrae piece or the tooth, shall we say? And even their own backyards. What do you think your parents are going to do if you start digging up the backyard to look for dinosaurs? Well, there's one part that's already a hole by Jackson, which is our dog. So we're going to find a that's dig up right there. The fence line over the dig site became a hub for dinosaur fans of all ages, hoping to catch a glimpse of what paleontologists had uncovered. I don't know where you grew up, but where I grew up, if we were to find something like this in the neighborhood, it would be a really big deal. It would color our outlook on science, how we view the natural world around us. Gosh, aren't we lucky to be a part of this? It would have been an astonishing thing in my childhood if something like that would have happened. And, and the kids there all felt the same way in the neighborhood. Suddenly, Thornton, a bedroom community still searching for an identity of its own, had attention from around the globe. Did this find put Thornton on the map? I think it did, at least for the people who track dinosaurs and, and the finds and, you know, the people who are really into that kind of stuff. I think it did. And I think even the layperson like me are just, you know, we're just kind of in awe. You were saying that when you got uh, to the site for the first time and on your way up there, you were getting choked up. I was. I was driving there and I had like butterflies in my stomach and I, I got a little choked up when I got to the site and saw everybody there just in awe. Where does that come from? I don't know. I, I, I think it's just pride in my community. You know, I love Thornton. <laughs> the police officers and firefighters who will use this building once it's finished became part of the discovery team too. Everybody has a little bit of nerd. Mine might be larger than the rest. Construction workers were captivated, bending their brakes, helping the dig. And Dan Wagner was never far from it. I think about it all the time. You know, when I go to bed, I'm thinking about dinosaur bones and, and how much is left and wake up and excited to go to the job site and see how much more we uncover. Dinosaur fever spread from this hole in the ground, past the fence line and into the heart of the city. A graphic artist reimagined Thornton's logo, where the roadways intersect to reflect the area's newest resident. I'm still advocating for you guys to make that the permanent logo. Yeah, me too. I think that would be great. <laughs> so whether or not that happens, you know, Thornton's had the same logo for a really long time. The city does expect that this building, when it's finished, will be permanently linked to the discovery somehow. The dinosaur was found next door to Brantner Elementary School. 
and those students would play a critical role, naming the discovery. How do you see out of there? I can't, I can't. <laughs> but first, they would have to meet it. What does it make you think? It makes me think that the dinosaurs could have been like right here walking in this, where the school is. Should we start digging right here in the middle of the gym? Yeah! <laughs> when you walked into, onto that site up there, you were a kid. It was just like digging in your backyard and you found something. You see this as a time machine for your own life. For my own life, absolutely. It, you, you, you can't come in here and work here and not feel that, that you're blessed and that you're, you just have that childlike joy of, of the things that we work on. Yeah! <laughs> Triceratops could grow up to 30 feet long and stand nearly 10 feet high, weighing anywhere from four to six tons, a prehistoric rhinoceros that would have given even the most ferocious predators pause before attack. So what did elementary students, after weeks of careful deliberation, name the Triceratops found in their own backyard? They considered Triceracops, Thorny, and Tritop, but the name they landed on for the largest Cretaceous find ever in Colorado, they called it Tiny. What do you think about the name Tiny? I think as long as the kids like it, I'm totally happy with it. It's it's got a little irony into yeah, it. Yeah, it does. The biggest you know? find yeah. ever. I, I, I would like to know the process they went through to, to pick that because it is completely ironic. Next, the Thornton Triceratops reveals a massive secret, uncovering a mystery hidden below the surface and changing everything scientists thought they knew about the discovery. It's more exciting now, isn't it? It's way more exciting. This, scientifically, just makes my heart race. The Thornton Triceratops is now in the hands of scientists at the museum and the hard work is just beginning. But before the dinosaur reveals any of its secrets, they'll have to scour through a mountain of bones. The fossils were taken to the museum's prep lab, where scientists started in on their first hard look at what they had found. I, you know, think about, okay, I am the only person that has ever seen this. When I unearth something in the lab or when a volunteer does, when you take the rock off of it, I am the only human being that has ever laid eyes on something that is 66 million years old. Fossil preparators delicately began removing soil a few grains at a time and glued the bones back together in places where they had been broken. Find a way to drop it on in a controlled way, right, so it's only hitting bone surface. The soft sand they were found in cut years off the process of reconnecting the puzzle. This becomes like the most difficult part of what you're doing though, right? Uh, one of the more difficult things, yeah. I would say, I mean, a lot of things in prep are, no two projects are the same. Everything that we work on in this lab is a different bone that has different sediment with different preservation things and just got to kind of figure out what's going on with each individual thing and roll with it. But since the initial discovery, the team had assumed that what they found here was like almost every triceratops they had ever seen. This one just in better condition. The dig team also uncovered a T-Rex tooth. Uncovered this tooth, just dumb luck. I didn't quite know what I'd found at the time. I thought it was another Triceratops tooth. This is a big tooth. They wanted to know if that was from a scavenger or a fatal battle between T-Rex and Triceratops. Surditch was hopeful the preservation of the fossils could also answer questions paleontologists have always had about how Triceratops lived. What can that lead us to? A better understanding of like their behavior? Yeah, so by looking at the skull, we might be able to learn things about their behavior and their morphology, how they were related to each other. So it might give us some insights into how horned dinosaurs evolved here in the Rocky Mountains. In the lab, preparators have been set to spend the next year uncovering a triceratops, inch by inch, working on a discovery that has captivated the scientific world. It's where this story was supposed to end, and for 13 weeks, it did. But on a day in late November, Dr. Surditch inspected the fossils in a secured lab, and everything changed. And when I walked away, they were cleaning off this area, and I expected them to reveal a typical Triceratops. I about dropped what was in my hands. This was totally not a Triceratops. Mm -hmm. What they found while removing soil was a large oval-shaped hole in the shield of the skull. Preparators may have initially dismissed it as an area broken over time, but when Surditch inspected it and noticed its perfect geometry, he knew what they found in Thornton wasn't a Triceratops at all. It was a dinosaur called Torosaurus. The bone is really thin, 
The shield, the frill, is really long, really wide, and it has a perfectly formed oval window or fenestra through the frill. Physically, Taurosaurus and Triceratops were identical, except for the noticeably larger shield on Taurosaurus's head. They also lived at the same time. Do you think people may have uh, uncovered Taurosaurus before and just thought, well, we're just missing this section here without knowing? Is that possible? Yeah, if you were to only find the face, so if you were only to find the, the brow horns forward, you would call it a Triceratops every time. For science, the find in Thornton is astronomical. Thousands of Triceratops have already been found around the world, but of Taurosaurus, just more than half a dozen are known. Do you think that this is a historic find? This is. This is the first definitive Taurosaurus from Colorado. Uh, this is uh, one of only a handful of Taurosaurus skulls known, and I think it's probably the most complete individual Taurosaurus specimen ever uncovered anywhere in North America. Science is all about taking a hypothesis and testing it. When new evidence comes along, changing the theory. And when new science is discovered in your own backyard, making it known to the rest of the world. How important is that for the continuation of what you guys do here? That's what science is, is that joy of discovery and the awe when you find something like this and you figure that critter lived here you know, so long ago, before the asteroid came. The museum hopes the Taurosaurus does something even bigger. So a lot of people ask me, are, haven't all the dinosaurs been discovered? And if you're a kid, that's pretty disheartening to think about. Maybe we're out of dinosaurs. And to be able to find them right outside your classroom window and realize that dinosaurs are still coming out of the ground all over the American West, all over the world, is a really cool thing for the next generation to think about. What's in that right there? The museum hopes the Taurosaurus find gets kids re-excited about science, the kind of excitement that made this Dr. Sertich's life's work. Like a lot of paleontologists, I'm just a, an overgrown kid. I never grew up. I never grew out of that dinosaur phase. They're real and they're all around us. And I think that's a really good thing that happened with this site is it reminded me and really everyone in the Denver area that we're around dinosaurs all the time. George Sparks says the power of discovery is overwhelming. Maybe this is that life-changing moment for them? Yeah. In fact, our mission is that we inspire curiosity and excite minds around nature and science. That's why we're here. And the people that built this museum, it was all about the awe and wonder of the natural world and getting people a chance to see things they didn't, couldn't see otherwise. For now, visitors to the museum can see the bones in person, while teams in the lab work every day to finish cleaning them. After that, the museum faces a big question, whether this find should get an articulated cast of its own to one day be on full display for visitors to see. And if it doesn't get a full display, its effects will be long lasting. Your grandchildren can come here, your great grandchildren can come here, and they'll probably see your name here. See my name on there? Yeah, I guess so. I hadn't thought of that. And the men who saved the Taurosaurus from being destroyed are being honored as well. Their names attached to the find and history forever. Be able to bring your family to the museum and show them something that was we were a part of is really cool. And now we have this great legacy. So that's, you know, that's something that we'll have forever. That's a legacy that'll hopefully live on for generations. Paleontologists' findings here could eventually rewrite the history books on the time of the dinosaurs. While they continue their work, the Taurosaurus will live here to be studied and to inspire. And thanks again to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for letting us share in this extraordinary find.